Particularly, I'm concerned about predicting or attempting uh, to predict flow in force uh, media. So before I get started, since I am doing this from Texas, I figured uh, that I'm going to put together a little postcard. Um, so greetings from Central Texas. And this entire pandemic time, my family and I spent a lot of time social distancing in state parks. Um, I, I, uh, I think that that has been a major contributor. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a tour. Um, so this is an enchanted rock natural area that is about an hour and a half from Austin. It's a one big piece of granite uh, rock. It's called pink granite. And it actually our state capital is made from this type of granite. Uh, this is quite a typical swimming hole. So Croatia knows everything and anything about karst. Uh, and there is a lot of karst, karsh, karst features uh, in Texas as well. And this is one of them. This is basically a creek that gets into a collapsed cave. And it's uh, one of the favorite swimming holes in Colorado, Colorado Bend State Park. And as temperatures get into 40 to 42 Celsius degrees, um, after you do a hike in very hot temperature and you get in to swim into those, it's uh, uh, heavenly. And this is Cato Lake State Park, one of the only natural lakes at the border of Louisiana. That landscape is quite different from the karst landscape. It's actually very marshy with beautiful tall trees. Um, and there's a, a lot of actually alligators in this water too. Uh, but it's a wonderful place to go on a boat ride and uh, see the wildlife. So just to give you a little bit of uh, greetings from Texas. All right, so without further ado, um, let me move on to our objective, what would we like to do? So my general area is flow in porous media, but I do it on quite a small scale. So I often uh, work on this um, scale that has basically millimeters on a side. So if you look into a rock, um, inside of a rock, you will see small pore spaces or voids that are typically on the micrometer side. So 10 to the minus six micrometers. So common sizes are 50 microns, for instance, for a typical sandstone. So what you see here is a little cube of about 2.5 millimeters on a side that has a gray area, which is a gray are the interfaces of rock and, uh, and the void spaces inside of that, uh, inside of that piece of rock. And then you, what you see is blue is trapped uh, oil, or it could be also trapped gas. So trapped non-wetting phase inside of the pore spaces. This is the, the stuff that we typically try to get get out when we uh, have plumes uh, or, or any kind of injection from injecting to a producing well. Uh, so basically those are the sort of the, the residual oil that we're trying to scoop towards the uh, projector. So knowing how this happens and having details of the displacement of these fluids, even on this small scale is crucial because it's this trapping that ha happens at this small scale. However, so that's the small scale that often controls things. However, we have to bridge quite a number of land scales to get to this other side that is actually field application scale that often goes in meters to kilometer scale. And the process of going from one to the other is called upscaling. Now we know all of the equations that govern the flow on this scale, for instance, those are called Navier-Stokes equations. You were probably tortured with some of those in your fluid mechanics class at some point, but basically it's a highly nonlinear equation that is difficult to solve. And this is basically the relationship for a velocity field and pressure field. And this is the viscosity of the fluid within without going into details. Now on larger scale, we typically resort to some version of Darcy's law. And in the, it's basic single phase flow uh, formulation. Uh, we like uh, to express flux. This is throughput through this rock. Uh, and it's, that flux is proportional to the gradient of pressure, including any gravity components. 
And the coefficients of proportionality are called permeability. And uh, this is viscosity of the fluid. So basically fluid and rock properties go into this uh, proportionality uh, relationship. And it's in the process of upscaling when we want to actually predict on large scale, problem is what is this permeability? And it's actually a field that spatially varies uh, and is different from uh, place to place, but the blocks of rocks, uh, rock are uh, assumed represented with one little cube like this. And basically if I figure out the permeability of that smaller sample, I will know what is the permeability of that larger block. And I use the populations of these permeabilities over uh, my reservoir to do reservoir simulation or large scale prediction in the field. So we somehow need to jump these scales. Now, um, one, how do I get about uh, estimating this permeability, for instance, or in multiple cases of multiple fluids, that would be relative permeability and also we need capillary pressure saturation uh, relationship. So there's theory, there's experiments, and there is what we refer to as direct simulation. So theory could be an expression like this, um, which is, uh, for instance, this is from sphere packings. So basically a theoretical estimate where I have a porosity a diameter of those grains or spheres in some sort of a constant that relates uh, them into a functional relationship. It's great when we have a relationship like this, but it's really limited to cases where we can do uh, this theoretical assessment. Most often than not, we will take a, some form of this uh, relationship and try to fit experimental measurements to it. So estimate the constants that remain in order to do uh, to get this functional relationship. So this is an example from a paper of basically measured permeabilities for Fontaine Blue Sandstone for a range of porosities. Now, this is when it works well. For sandstones, they're pretty well understood. But for something that is much more complex, uh, this, these relationships become a little more complicated. And this is where I would like to resort to a direct simulation. So if I have an image, which we these days have from X-ray microtomography, for instance, uh, if I have an image of a rock on this small scale, I can process it and produce what we refer to as a segmented or binarized image. And then I can compute the velocity field using that Navier-Stokes equation. Now, this process is great because I can take any piece of rock, presumably, and just do that. We know the equations. However, what's not so great is that this takes quite a bit of time. Now, experiments take time but so does this, and it takes high performance computing facilities. And I'm gonna show you some of the timings for this. But if I get this velocity field, I can basically integrate it to get those fluxes compared to Darcy's law and get the, what the permeability is. So those are my three ways. And where machine learning jumps in, it can jump in on any of these scales and essentially assuming that you have either enough measurements or simulations you would like to make that prediction faster. So that's, uh, that's the component where machine learning or what I'm gonna to refer to is deep learning can help. But these are traditional ways to estimate these. So this is an example of a uh, limestone uh, or uh, carbonate features that are challenged. And again, uh, there's plenty of uh, carbonate examples uh, in Croatia because of all of their um, uh, all of their complexity in solubility in water, they often um, open up these pore spaces that are much more complicated. And because of that, uh, there, it's, it's, it's much more difficult to predict what is this permeability uh, versus porosity relationship. For instance, you can see um, uh, an example like this. Uh, there is no one curve that describes this cloud of points, permeability versus porosity. You have to go through the process of uh, separating these cloud points into rock types and then attempt to find the functional relationship for all of the different types or classes that you find in there. So that's a quiet and involved process. And this, what we refer to as digital rock physics, attempts to circumvent that by taking a sample doing imaging, 
uh, whatever type of imaging is appropriate for this piece of rock, then building a three-dimensional model and then getting this uh, simulation-based properties. So those simulation-based properties could be based on any type of simulation, uh, whether it's fluid mechanics or mechanical deformation. So you could get porosity, permeability, relative permeability, capillary pressure, saturation, formation factor, Young, modulus, and so forth. So this is sort of like an introduction of where uh, uh, we are at. Are there any questions before I move on? Is there any term that I need to explain again? Yes. So far, so good. It's okay. So far, so good? Okay. I'm trying to make this conversational across the screen and <laughs> whatnot. <laughs> It'd be nice to be in the room, but uh, uh, let's do the best we can uh, with this. All right. So here's a little bit just to zoom in to give you what these difficulties are and why is uh, 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 why is a carbon why a carbon is problematic? So these are examples. So this is also uh, it's about 2.1 millimeters across, and you could see fracture. This is imaged chalk, really. Uh, uh, so this chalk has fracture within. Then it has this dissolved bugs, and these bugs, if they're on large scale, they're called a cave. <laughs> so essentially, they run on all scales. Uh, the solution features. And then next to it, you have microporous pore space. So there's like a wide range of pore sizes within a piece of sandstone. And there's a, a, a what cuts across here, uh, this piece is cuts across a bug in the back. So this is a three dimensional piece that is right here somewhere. It also has a portion of these uh, fractures that is uh, here is, is a little bigger. So there's a bug behind and there's multiple fractures. There's actually a thin fracture in between these, um, uh, these um, uh, surfaces. Okay? And these fractures are not simple. They're actually branching out into a fracture network. So let me show you how displacement, this is simulation of displacement looks like. If my non wetting fluid said, say that uh, oil or gas is coming into a water wet formation. I'm, I'm sorry, may, 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 may I jump Go in ahead. and ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, what, what we're looking at right now, what, what, what's this image? I'm, I'm not so this not is the image, okay. So this image here All is right. a small volume that is actually sitting. So what you're looking at here is a cross section, a single section through a three-dimensional stack of images through this rock on this type of a scale. So this is the complexity of the pore spaces that you see. This is These are the spaces where these bugs and fractures are. That's where fluids move in this rock. Right. Uh -huh. So this is one cross-section, and I took one three-dimensional piece. It's hard to visualize. So I took one three-dimensional piece of it through right here, okay? So that uh -huh. would be this piece over here, like this kind of top cross-section. Uh -huh. And you're looking at the how it looks in three dimensions. So you see a box. So this oh, is an oh, actual okay. small piece of volume. And so it's a piece of a back. piece, okay. Mm -hmm. Piece of a piece. And you're looking at the portion of this opening, the bug in the back. It's right there. You can see sort of surface of it. But that's the problem of visualizing three, uh, things in three dimensions. If mm -hmm. I visualize where, where you don't see anything, that's where the rock is, the actual grains. But I can't show them. If I show them, you won't see where the pore spaces are. <laughs> right? right. So I have to... I have to... So this is, your, this is your attempt to visualize uh, yeah. pore spaces, is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. And that's, again, the hardship is that you have to just visualize surfaces. In, so this is just the surface in between the rock and the pore space. Because if I show everything else, you won't see anything. Correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. You'll see a little block, right? You'll see, right. Like, you'll see like this, a block, a rock, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the, but thank you for the question. So that probably a lot of people had that question. So basically my fluid will enter, uh, let me go to now a larger image. So fluid will enter or try to push in, say that I have a wetting fluid everywhere and that the non-wetting try to push in. 
So again, I can't now show in the simulation, I can't show these rock surfaces because if I show them, I will not see where the fluid interfaces are. So this is the fluid pushing against another fluid inside of this rock. And it's colored so that you see red where the interface with the fluid is, another fluid, and you see gray where I'm contacting the rock. And that changes as I'm pushing in, and actually I have less and less contact with, uh, with the uh, other fluid and more and more contact with the rock as I push in. So this is how it looks then. So this is the, again, visualizing the simulation. And you can see how fluid enters the fracture. It doesn't enter all of the fracture. So for instance, this piece is too tight and it's actually a dead end. And there's the wetting fluid that remains there. I can't show it again, or I'm not showing it here because if I show both fluids where they are, I'm not gonna be able to see how the displacement happens. Now, when I go back, uh, then something like this happens. And I have some of this non-wetting fluid trapped in tight spots. Basically, wetting fluid sneaks around in three-dimensional space. It can go multiple places and it can kind of trap uh, fluids. And this is how residual saturation happens uh, for non-wetting fluids. So we use simulation to understand how it happens, but we can also then quantify this. So you can go and calculate where things are so I can get my I'm showing here as a normalized curvature, but this is really capillary pressure if I multiply it with interfacial tension. So see capillary pressure versus saturation. And I see the standard drainage inhibition curves. And what I again observe is what we standardly observe is that drainage does not happen the same way inhibition does. So nothing is really reversible in rocks. So you push in one way, but there's always some a different way to come back and there's a certain, thermodynamically things are not reversible. I cannot go back to the same position. Most importantly, I will have some fluids left behind. And it's often that we are after those fluids in try, uh, trying to recover them in enhanced oil recovery. So that's uh, just an example of how this direct simulation happens on the small scale. If I had a reservoir scale, I, it could happen the similarly. It's just that now you wouldn't see details, all of the details of this four space, such as you see here. You would have spaces in rock represented with their permeability and porosity. And that's this upscaling step. But we are trying to get to these permeabilities and these uh, descriptors of the, uh, of the blocks in a reservoir simulation. All right. Now, so what are the problems in this? Problem is that this simulation is beautiful, but it takes quite a bit of a long time. And actually reservoir simulation takes quite a bit of a long time too. We'd like to speed up both. Um, now we are starting from uh, this type of simulation, but the concept translates. So in this single and two phase flow simulations, if you have this piece of 3D uh, microstructure from the rock, um, you could also image experiments themselves. That's done in a pretty standard way these days. Where it's limited is more complex flows. So multiple three-phase fluids, or if you have fluids that are complicated by themselves. So foams, polymers, maybe I have particulate suspensions. And one example here from another student of mine um, is shown if you have particles uh, getting, such as those from drilling fluid trying to get into the rock. Uh, this is um, how they filter through the pore spaces uh, of rock again. So any kind of coupled processes where I have possibly both flow and reaction happening at the same time, or I possibly have things on multiple scales, those are things that are right now limited because they take a lot of computational power. So um, in, in terms of imaging in, in, of these rocks, we can actually image much more than we can simulate in. And that's so our acquisition of data and images is much larger than our ability to process them. So that's a bottleneck that one would like to overcome. And there's also quite a bit of, I'm showing these binarized images, but there is a step that goes between that image in grayscale that you saw and the image that can actually serve as input to the simulation. Um, and that, um, that can take quite a bit of time. So, in all of this space, though, 
there is a lot of data produced right now. And it'll be great to put it all together in one place and have algorithms potentially, and this is where machine learning comes in, learn how to get from just this description of the space or possibly on larger scale description of the entire reservoir and figure out what the velocity field looks like without all of the detailed steps of simulation. But if you have enough simulations, maybe you can train um, uh, machine learning algorithms to actually get you to this faster. And that's something that we have uh, tried to do. Because again, all of this simulation in forest media, it takes hours to days on high performing, uh, performance computing systems. And I would like to actually get information from all of the possible lens scales that I have and kind of integrate them to a larger scale. So that would be the second step in this process. Uh, now, I, there's a lot of these images if you actually just want to look at how they look like. Um, the, something called Digital Rocks Portal that I maintain. Uh, if you just Google it, uh, you should be able to find it immediately. But this is a place where people share images uh, such as those from X-ray microtomography. Um, again, that imaging is quite expensive. Once you do it and once you uh, write your papers on it, then it'd be great if it can be um, shared. And in that sense, um, uh, this is the place to share it. And for me now, it beco it's becoming a place where I come in and download a lot of different data sets, not just from my research group, from, but from different groups and train the algorithms. All right. <clears throat> containing the image and also the porosity parameter data? Uh, if people volunteer it, yes. But this is the question. Where, so I am asking that question when people are uploading the data. Do you have matching experiments? And can you actually provide that? Uh, for sure, people often do this when they're publishing papers. So they also mention the paper where they publish. So if they have any experimental measurements, they're typically in the paper that is associated with the data set. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's a great question because you'd like to have all of those information uh, yeah, available. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm doing my own research. I'm mm -hmm. how, the, how we can define fructosity and try to relate with the wrong type things. Uh, right. I have some uh, hypothesis so far, but I need the turbocity data if it's possible exported from this uh, imaging uh, process. Right, so it is. Uh, now, right now, what we have on Digital Rocks Portal is a lot of data. Um, if you need codes that find tortuosity, I can point you to the sum that I know that are available online. Please. Yeah. So, uh, just uh, my name is, as long as you type it into Google uh, correctly, uh, I'm the only one that shows up so far, Masha Prodanovich. I haven't seen that combination. So that's useful. So if you search for me, um, uh, you, the one that shows up, it's, it is me. Find my email address. It's masha at uxxs.edu. Uh, but feel free to contact me and I'll point you in the right direction. All right. All of the stuff that I know. Thank you, thank you. But there is more and more software. And actually, this is one of my, <laughs> this is a little bit of a side, but it is actually related. When we come to the machine learning part, uh, machine learning actually needs a lot of labeled, what's called supervised machine learning. It needs a lot of labeled pairs of things. So let's say that I did a lot of simulations. So I have a pair of, I'm pairing up input to the simulation to its result. And I'm giving that to the machine learning process and I'm telling it, hey, can you find a shorter way or a faster way to get from input to the result? So in that process, we need to have a lot of these pairs of data sets, right? And this digital works portal is one attempt to do that from everyone to be able to uh, get from A to B. But it can be uh, a lot of like, there's a lot of uh, components of simulation that grabs this input and requires this input. So uh, you need tortuosity, for instance, so it can serve a lot of different purposes and that's the whole point of sharing this data online. So yeah, so just email me and I'll follow up. All right, so uh, 
our objective here is to get that image that I showed you, and I have plenty of them in the, doing a new exploration of a well, and I'm imaging as I go along. So I have all of those images, and I'd like a permeability log. Permeability log is still something that is difficult, especially if you're something like a carbon. Can I go from A to B much faster without spending eight to 10 hours of simulation on each of those images. And that's if I have images, inputs ready to go. So in this process, we'd like to leverage computer vision um, uh, advances and to essentially processing image and video content for online, um, such as in YouTube or Facebook or social media of this world. And there was a lot of development that was done there. Um, all of those, they don't often use the classical parallel computers. They actually use optimized hardware in form of GPUs. And there's a lot of code that is already available and shared open source. Uh, and because of that the advancements. So uh, there are open source uh, Python based tools such as TensorFlow and Keras that are widely shared actually by the makers of these GPUs. So these enable uh, fast and accurate uh, predictions. Um, uh, now, what they enable fast and accurate prediction of right now is that facial recognition. When you go on to social media and you post an image, and they quickly find that so-and-so is in that image. That type of uh, quick sped up by machine learning algorithms that are behind, that are specifically working with images. And we'd like to do a technology transfer of some of that to the images that we have that are a little more complicated. They're not people's faces, they're actually rocks, but the concept remains the same. We'd like to pro provide fast, and accurate fluid flow prediction um, based on these images. Uh, now, again, as I pointed out, we're harvesting these advances that are brought by images and videos that people post on YouTube. And they're often kind of trivial. Like there's actually a statistic that's pretty amazing. More than 500 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every minute. And this is a piece of information from 2019. 95% of global internet population watches YouTube. 37% of mobile internet traffic again belongs to YouTube. So managing the content that is constantly both uploaded and viewed requires help from artificial intelligence. Um, this is one example of some. And one pet video is literally some cute and funny cat video that has 1.5 million views. Right? Um, and this person has um, a lot of subscribers that are constantly watching that uh, content and you can actually make some money. It's my understanding that basically if somebody with this many subscriber, uh, subscribers posts a video, they can earn an income from YouTube from all of the advertising that goes along with those uh, on, in the, on the order of up to thousand free space in LA for anyone that has 10,000 plus subscribers. Okay? So there is quite a bit of money in it. That's essentially the point. And because of that, there was a lot of uh, investment in the research to manage this content. So here are some advancements in algorithms that are trying to label images, just images like photographs. Uh, so there was, uh, there was a classification challenge that was done. And basically from 2010 uh, down to 2015, this is uh, the first time in 2015 is when algorithms surpassed the human labeling precision. And that's thanks to machine or what is actually deep learning using convolutional neural networks. So this jump or like being able to get over for that uh, labeling uh, category um, is, is something that is thanks to convolutional neural networks. Now, these benchmark data sets are quite widely available in the field of just regular images because we 
we all act online on a daily basis. For scientific purposes, that's a little different. And Digital Works Portal is one of those portals that is trying to provide science images and not just um, cats, cat videos. Okay. Now, just a quick primer, and I'm actually going to go into, uh, if you all don't mind, into a little more than just, let me see. I have only two slides here. Let me just go into a little uh, deeper presentation with a little more jargon, but I think it's useful because the jargon, uh, machine learning these days is quite uh, popular. So I think it's uh, useful to know a little bit about what's the and machine learning in itself is pretty broad. Uh, you can apply it to any different types of data or the problem. I'm going to show you the uh, one specific application, but think about it broadly. So here's just a quick uh, concept in the deep learning uh, technology. So normally what we refer to as a neural network um, has some inputs, and I'm calling them X1 and X2 here. They're coming to a neuron, and this is mimicking our process in the brain. And our neuron takes that input, it doesn't activate. Okay? So let's say that I'm, 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 it's morning over here where I am, I need my coffee, and then mm, beautiful, I, I, I smell my coffee and that activates some of the neurons in my brain uh, that are actually reacting positively to this smell. So that's sort of like a positive reaction or that smell might be bad. Maybe the coffee isn't good or maybe it's been sitting for too long or something of that sort. And I'm going to have a negative reaction. So you have to have like this, you can basically classify these reactions into, well, my, some of the neurons for the, the pause, they're one, they're activated, and some of the, the others did not, they're zero, they didn't activate. So it's this activation of a neuron okay, to zero or one state is that gives me a recognition of this smell or not. Okay? And that is my output Y here. Okay? So that's, um, now, neurons don't calculate, but if we were trying to, or that they, they do uh, things in a little more obscure way, but if you try to now model this and replicate this process, we need so we can program it, right? So not only that we have one neuron, we have multiple neurons and they're kind of interconnected. So this is a network of neurons. So these a layer that you see here in green, those are my neurons and the inputs, uh, there's input layer. Those are the inputs that are coming from the uh, one side in output or recognition or uh, prediction uh, is here as well. So how do we actually now organize this using some functional relationship? Now I can have a single layer of neurons. Most of the time when you look at something termed deep learning, it has multiple layers. So it has this much more complicated neural network. Okay? And this network is something that we design uh, so it's typically a given. So you have input layer, and then you have these hidden layers, uh, uh, an output layer. So as I pass my data through this, I'm training all the parameters. So a uh, fully connected neural network has interconnections in between all of the neurons that it could have, but I can also remove some of them. Huh? Now let's name these parameters within because this is actually where the math of it happens. Um, so parameters are all the variables. So there are inputs and they're actually combined using these weights. So I'm gonna have, for instance, uh, I'm gonna take this input X1 plus W4 times X2 and that's gonna be uh, combined here in this neuron. I might add it one more number, which is B1, it's called a bias. And then I'm gonna do activation function of that sum. Okay? And I'm going to then uh, go into my next layer. Okay? So this is the math that we're doing in each of these neurons. And all of these weights that I'm using in this process and combining my inputs at a neuron are in this process. Okay? Now, 
we don't actually call these things inputs, we call them features. Uh, so again, they're, they're, it's just the naming, and this is why I wanted to introduce this. So their features are attributes. Um, and these are the, 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 the features is what I'm using to get the uh, uh, output. Now, if I wanted to place this in the oil uh, jargon, so let's say that I'm using the, the data I have is viscosity and density. In, so this is a typical uh, classification problem. So then basically I'm going to come in with a bunch of measurements of densities and different densities and different, uh, different viscosities. And I'm going to, uh, and for those measurements, I know whether they're all in oil and water. So they're gonna say, serve as my labeled uh, data set that I'm gonna use my uh, network to train to then recognize whether something is oil of uh, viscosity and density comes in. So that's essential objective. And you can replace these inputs and outputs to whatever it is that you like and whatever type of data that you have uh, in this training. Okay. So <clears throat> basically this would be a simple small network with a single uh, layer. And what happens at each of these um, at each of these neurons? So, for instance, at this neuron one, I'm combining W one times this feature plus W four some bias B one into a sum, and based on that sum, I'm going to use an activation function to fire whether it's one or zero or something in between, and that's going to give me a prediction. Right? So. Uh, basically, this uh, activation function is called sigma, often, or it's labeled sigma, and that's the decider in each neuron. Now, so just to see whether everybody paid attention, uh, true or false, this network is of a deep neural network. False. False. Anybody else? False. False. Anybody in the room? False. Good. So I have only one layer, so that's not deep enough, I guess. <laughs> so uh, this is not a deep neural network. All right. So this, what this activation function can be, um, there's a so-called sigmoid function. That's one example. Uh, they typically have this, um, they go from zero to one, and they have some transition in between. Um, there's quite a bit of are the functions that work best, but again, they typically have some form uh, like this. And they, 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 they take this weighted sum of inputs and then produce an output uh, based on it or the labeling based on it, okay? And the, the, the work that I'm gonna show you later <coughs> uses this uh, so-called uh, scaled exponential linear unit SELU as an activation function. And honestly, it was a trial and error to find that that works better than the others. So um, here's an example. Uh, so, so, so how do I now train? So let's say that at the end of this, um, this oil, uh, so this activation function produced a result of 0 0.25. But I'd like this label to be closer to one because for this labeled data set that I'm training with, I know that this was oil, so the label should be one or closer to one. So this is where now I pass forward through this network, and now I'm actually going to start training. So I'm going to start changing hyperparameters. These way closer to this label of one. And that's the part where the network is training its parameters, all of these labels that are sitting in the network, um, it's training using the data that comes in. And of course, the more data I have, hopefully I'm going to start converging and getting to better and better results when I give it my, uh, so whenever I have data that I'm training with, I'm gonna use one part for training and one for validation. And then after that, no matter which input comes in, I can use this network to guess whether this is oil and water based on the label that you uh, you end up with here at the end. 
And there's this loss in how do I calculate, well, did I do things right? There's basically an error function. And I'm not going to um, time on it, but basically you can um, look at, for instance, mean absolute error over um, a, a number of samples. Um, and you can customize this loss function based on what makes sense for you that you're getting uh, closer to the result you need. But if you're training things well in machine learning, then this loss function as you're going through batches, uh, more and more data, this is kind of iterations, epochs. Um, this is naming for iteration. As you iterate through, you're gonna get better and better. Now, also these uh, hyperparameters and optimizing them is called backpropagation. So I go forward, I get my label, and I realize, oh, in this case, I should up this label to be closer to one. In this case, maybe I need to down uh, this other label to be closer to zero. And there's a method behind it, which is essential optimization that has been known in math uh, for a long while or used, which is the method of gradient this to, to basically uh, uh, to, to optimize this process. So uh, the chances that I have, I'm just going to pinpoint the basic detail, the chances that I have to increase this activation from my label 0 0.25 that I need to improve to be one. Um, I can increase bias B, I can increase my Ws, okay? or I can change my uh, um, other weights inside, inside. So those are the the the, the thing that's the space uh, with respect to which I'm going to uh, try to optimize uh, my results. So any optimization problem will typically uh, look at the gradient and try to uh, move in the direction of the largest descent in that gradient. So I'm going to skip uh, some of these. Um, so again, these are the the details that I can change in the process of training. So that's what machine learning algorithms do. So I'm not gonna um, spend too much time on gradient descent because I think I kind of um, uh, stepped too much into the details, but the is something that has been around for a while. So then one has to be careful uh, how you're, uh, how uh, fast you are trying to get to that minimum. And in any optimization problem, when you're lo looking for local minima or maxima in uh, some training process, there is a problem, well, am I getting to the local minimum or I'm getting to some global minimum? So this is something that is common in optimization and is not just specific for machine learning. Okay. Um, and then there is the, uh, the method to implement this gradient descent is called an optimizer. Uh, we're using one that is labeled Adam, but there's multiple of them. And of course, depending which optimizer you use, you might have a uh, faster training. Uh, just, to, uh, just to do a quick question. So if I have a neural network, uh, true or false, the network structure, this number of the neurons, layers and so forth, and how they're connecting, does not change during the training. The structure will not change, it's the weighting that change. Correct. So essentially, uh, uh, basically, oh, I have, uh, the, the structure doesn't change and this is where the art of machine learning comes in. Uh, essentially, um, that's what I'm keeping fixed and that's what I design and different designs might work better or worse for my problem. So there's a lot of trial and error spends finding a correct design for your problem. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I have uh, 10 more minutes, uh, I was told, and I'm going to skip uh, the details. Now just convolutional neural networks, what they do, this detail I will provide, is that they can take image data. So not just one number, but they're basically trying to process image data using something called convolutions and process uh, data that has structure. So this cat has structure. It's the image of a cat and it has shape. And the convolutions will actually basically take this image and process it down 
in their number of layers and pooling to a number that can actually play in this machine learning algorithms and then get classified, such as in the case that I just shown, into a cat or not cat, zero or one. Right? So basically in this labeling process, I need to work with a structure that is in form of an image and convolutions help uh, in that. Okay? So I'm gonna, um, uh, convolutions can basically find where certain features and structures are in the image. So here's an example that will find the vertical edges in this image or horizontal edges in this image. So these filters or convolutions uh, are processing images. So those are convolutional neural networks and we're gonna use them in this work as well. So I'm gonna stop with this introduction and now go back to how did we use these convolutional neural networks um, to basically predict flows and what was our success in that. So we were working with three-dimensional images and that is the bottleneck in this work. If I have actually three-dimensional stacks, the process becomes uh, like really um, uh, uh, intense computationally of the training. So what we need to typically do is take a larger image and break of those four structures. And that's what we're using in the training in my uh, neural networks. So here's one example of convolutional filter uh, that has this uh, structure that passes through the image. And as it does, it produces this image of features uh, or so-called diagonal edges. And that can be used as part of the inputs that go into the training of a deep uh, neural network. And these uh, structural features in force media are important. Geometry is our, that we can give it a selection of these filters or features uh, that will then predict uh, my flow well. And there was some previous work done that was done in two dimensional images for uh, velocity fields around objects and some in porous media as well, prior to the work that we uh, do. But most of the porous media, they attempted to just predict the label of permeability directly. What we are trying to do is actually pre predict velocity fields. So, I'm not sure. so basically we want to go from binary image to velocity field. You can't just give it binary image and be successful. That simply doesn't work. That training never converges. What we had to select is a number of features along the way that is also um, uh, that are that are that were instrumental in adding important information for this network to be able to learn and predict an actual velocity field. So uh, basically. Some so forth, maximum squared spheres. They're actually known in research. But they're sort of derivatives of this image that were crucial to select correct, correctly to actually for this process to work. Otherwise, it's simply just the training doesn't, your loss function never gets a very things to get. Okay? So we've done that. This Euclidean distance, this is distances from the grains within the, uh, within the, um, within the structure. Tortuosity, somebody asked about tortuosity, was another one. Uh, also time of flight from one side to the other, from left to the right of the image, as well as this maximum inscribed sphere within image. This is essentially the approximate field was, could be viewed as this neural network uh, function, a complicated function as you uh, go through the neural network of this structure, uh, the, the pore size distribution, its connectivity and its tortuosity. Okay. So the network is actually quite humongous, but it was taken from the, so all of these pieces actually have these uh, CNNs or convolutional neural networks within, and you give a whole lot of in, in the network to predict velocity field. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of the network, but it's so-called so unit that we took from some other image classification work. So our training set were sphere packings. So here's an example uh, of a sphere packings uh, where we uh, designed them in 
sort of decreasing porosity so we have multiple porosity values. So this is tighter and tighter. This is mimicking uh, numerical uh, cementation or diagenesis. And essentially, these were our trainings. <clears throat> we used one GPU with 24 gigabytes of memory. So then after training, so we trained it with those data sets. We took sandstones uh, to basically test it. So that our test set were sandstones of different porosity, as well as different volumes that we grabbed from Digital Rocks portal. Most of them were relatively um, not so heterogeneous. So this works for uh, data set where heterogeneities are kind of contained within this 80 in the uh, creating subsets for neural networks. But here is an example. Uh, so we ran the simulations of four velocity fields using lattice Boltzmann methods. And these are the timings that took for those simulations. So anywhere between four hours and two days for a single image, thousand Q. And that's the time that we're trying to then now use these simulations to cut down that time. And indeed, uh, not only that we did that, so basically this by, by our, on our test set after training. So you can see that we are spot on in predicting uh, permeability for these, but also the time for CNN is essentially uh, seconds okay? and uh, up to a minute. And you can find these results in the paper. So this is this whole for automating and this is where uh, machine or deep learning can help because if I have properly trained network, I can now give it an image and get a prediction much faster than I would with I'm going to, uh, we've done two generations of this. Um, I'm going to essentially skip over the second part uh, because I did want to actually explain properly the terminology I'm using. But again, there's a little bit of uh, playing uh, with these networks which work better. An essential key problem to overcome in these images is this uh, right now for three dimensional images, there's a bottleneck of training uh, I need to break down my large image into small components, containing some of my bugs within those. Okay? So I need to, we did actually have what I call a generation two of, uh, of, uh, uh, of networks that work better for more data that is more heterogeneous than a sandstone or a well-behaved carbonate. So I'm gonna skip uh, over those networks, but there is a paper that is available on that. And we can actually now um, predict well about sands and sandstones and fractures or the media that has these larger features that are problematic with that original, uh, original uh, that are prob problematic to predict with the original method. So there is uh, the second paper on that. Now, just to briefly discuss before we close, this uh, artificial intelligence approaches, uh, they, they really have a hope in science as well. Uh, social media data is volunteered for scientific endeavors or scientific machine learning. Or we need uh, more data of whatever it is uh, that you're tr trying to get about a thousand examples uh, of a feature that you're trying to successfully predict. So if that was recognizing a cat in images of animals, you need about a thousand examples of cats for these things to learn. Now, if I'm taking that into control engineering, then I need to have uh, examples of whatever it is that I'm trying to predict in um, uh, subsurface and I need to have enough examples of it. So we need these quality benchmarks. Um, so data, using data within the same research group or a company is probably not enough because there's a built-in bias uh, and specific data samples. So we need more and more data. These algorithms are data hungry. <laughs> um, and again, I mentioned already Digital Rocks Portal as a place to, um, uh, uh, to find things. Now, in images of rocks, we are not trying to classify things into cats and fish. We're trying to actually find uh, different features <laughs> in, a, in a much more complex image. So we need probably much more data um, then uh, it is required for uh, cats and 
dogs in videos. So uh, we need uh, benchmark uh, subsets. And we need the data across different scales. So I might see different features on a different scale of an image. So we should collect uh, data for all of the scales. Okay. So I'm going to leave it and skip this. Uh, one thing that I would love to predict is something like this particulate flow and in time. <laughs> Again, uh, for predicting something that is a complex flow like this, this is direct simulation and it was quite a bit of uh, this, this simulation ran on 48 processors for around 100 hours. It would be wonderful to, some 10 years from now, have enough data to train algorithms to predict something that is dynamic uh, like this. But I think uh, with enough uh, training, uh, we can actually get there. So without that, I'm going to thank you. Uh,